In quantum mechanics, it is very useful to have an orthonormal basis set. Every basis vector is orthogonal with each other. Which means that the inner product with a basis vector not of itself is zero. In addition, the norm of each basis vector is 1. If a basis set is not orthonormal to begin with, one can apply the so-called Gram-Schmidt procedure to construct an orthonormal basis set. In this video, we explain how to use the Gram-Schmidt procedure to obtain an orthonormal basis set of vectors, A, J, where J goes from 1 to N in n-dimensional vector space. Starting from a basis set, B, which is non-orthonormal. We begin with a non-orthonormal basis set B1, B2, and so on up to Bn. That spans a n-dimensional complex vector space. In general, these vectors are not orthogonal with one another. Thus their inner product B sub I with B sub J does not satisfy the Kronecker delta function. The Gram-Schmidt process take this finite, linearly independent set of vectors and generates an orthonormal set. Herein denoted as C1, C2 and so on up to Cn that spans the same n-dimensional complex vector space. The procedure begins by picking the first vector C1, which can be any unit vector of your choice. Here, we shall pick B1ket. Since it might not necessarily be normalized, we divide it by the square root of its inner product with itself. Thus, C1 defined as such is normalized. Next, we want to generate the second vector C2 from the vector B2. Since the vectors B sub J are linearly independent, this implies that one cannot find two vectors which are collinear. Thus, we are assured that the vector B2 is not collinear with B1, and must contain a component that is orthogonal to B1, or similarly C1. The basic idea then is to extract out this component orthogonal to C1, to be our next basis vector C2. This is best illustrated geometrically as shown. The component of B2 collinear with C1 can be obtained by projecting B2 onto C1, which is given by the inner product of the two vectors multiplied by C1 as shown in the green box. The component of B2 orthogonal to C1 is then B1 minus the component collinear with C1, which is B2 minus the quantity in the green box, as shown in the yellow box. We shall denote this as C2 prime. Clearly, C2 prime is orthogonal to C1, but it is not necessarily normalized. Our last step is simply to divide C2 prime with its norm. This gives us the final expression for C2 as shown below. Now, we have the vectors C1 and C2, which are orthogonal to each other and normalized. These two vectors span the orange 2D plane as shown. Next, we want to generate the third vector C3 from the vector B3. Since the vectors B sub J are linearly independent, this implies that the vector B3 does not lie on this orange plane, where the vectors B1 and B2 spans. Hence, the vector B3 must contain a component that is orthogonal to this orange plane. Similar to the previous case, the basic idea is to extract out this component that is orthogonal to C1 and C2. And let that be our C3. This is best illustrated geometrically in the right figure. The components of B3 collinear with C1 and C2 can be obtained by projecting B3 onto C1 and C2 respectively. The component of B3 that is orthogonal to the orange plane is then B3 minus the components which are collinear with C1 and C2. And the explicit expression is shown in the yellow box. Thus C3 is given by this expression, divide by its norm as shown below. Hopefully, by now you see the pattern. The subsequent vectors C4, C5 and so on can be obtained in similar fashion. In summary, after defining the first vector C1, the subsequent C vectors can be obtained by taking the B vector counterpart, and minus the components which are collinear with the previous C vectors, and then normalizing it. The formula is explicitly given here as shown. Stay tuned, and subscribe, so you will be notified of our future episodes. Join our Free Science Academy Discord channel to discuss science and technology. High school students are welcome to join and post your questions, we will answer them during our free time.